Well, good morning. Good morning. I am, I, you know, I say this each week in one variation or another, but it's certainly true every week. I am thrilled to open God's Word together with each of you this morning. Amen. We are, amen. We are continuing in our study of Ecclesiastes. Solomon is taking his wisdom and insight into our lives to a different level this morning. Uh, if you would, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Now, I know we send the text out uh, on Saturday to let you know where we're going to be. I'm not sure whether the fact that we're covering a whole chapter today or that it rained a lot has kept some away. So we might have to revisit that. But we, uh, we do have a lot to cover. We're going to jump right into it. What I would say is there's such a necessity to God's word in the life of God's children. And most specifically, we'll see in this chapter just a, a very simple truth that is continually before us that we often miss. Uh, the, the truth is, we are those who are self-aware, we are self-focused, and we are self-promoting uh, in our flesh. Which is to say, in a singular word, we, we are selfish. Now, you may be tempted to deny that this morning, to think to yourself, now wait just a minute, I've certainly been selfish, but to say that I am selfish seems like a, a stretch, well, I would like to give a, just a quick litmus test for consideration to understand if I'm telling you the truth or not. Consider for a moment if there were some way to record the thoughts of a human's both head and heart. Every thought that crosses through your mind, that crosses over your heart, that, that conjures up or might not ever leave your, your mouth but is there. If there was a way to do that, what, what person would dominate the percentage of both on a daily basis in an individual's life. It would be themselves, right? That would be the dominating focus uh, of people that you would focus, that I would focus, that every human being focuses most on self. And the truth is, it's because we are naturally in our nature selfish people. It's our nature to be so. And left to natural courses, each person will continue in that vein. And we're going to see that a little bit more fully in our time this morning. But think about this. It, it kind of makes sense in a degree. If the world is pursuing after that, it, it makes sense because we would think that the person who is most focused on self, who most promotes self, who most thinks upon self, who most strives after what self wants, well, that person would be the most satisfied in and with themselves. In a worldly sense, or by a rational logic, that makes perfect sense. In other words, the more one makes self the point of their lives, the more their lives will be self-fulfilling, right? Solomon says, wrong. That's not how that works. It, in fact, creates or produces the opposite. Now, we've been learning for the past three chapters how it is that we should live a faithful and satisfying life under the sun. That in this life we've been given, how do we live both a faithful and satisfying, even enjoyable life under the sun? And Solomon's been continual in pointing us back to reality. He, he doesn't let us live in fantasy land. He doesn't let us play let's pretend or make believe in our lives because that will never lead us to true and genuine enjoyment, satisfaction, or anything else. It's just fake. And so he's continually pointing us back so that our pursuits can be actual. And if our pursuits are actual, then they will, in fact, bear actual benefit, which ought to be our desire. What he's been saying for these chapters is if you believe that you are the captain of all things, or even the captain of your own destiny, then prepare yourself. You're going to face continual disappointment and dissatisfaction. For in the reality of this life, that is vanity of vanity, and it's striving after the wind. There, there's no end to it. If you think that leaving a mark upon this world is your lot in life, then be aware you will become the one marked in the end. For this is vanity and striving after the wind. If your life is continually shaped by achieving and accomplishing, then be prepared. There shall be no end to your desires to achieve and accomplish. But there is going to be an end to your abilities to do these things. For this too is vanity and a striving after the wind. Solomon reminds us continually in every way that we are not God. But in so doing, he's pointing us to the truth that there is a God. And that if we look to him, we can find satisfaction, peace in all things. 
You are the creature. I am the, create, I am the creature as well. We are neither the creator. And all that we have been given, every day that we have, every hour, every second, every moment, is a gift from him. If we would but live humbly and faithfully within this reality, then we can and will know true peace and satisfaction. Life is striving after the wind if it is pursuing after what this world offers, temporal things. Trying to chase and catch, and sadly catching, but never being satisfied, so chasing more. Someday, know this truth. Beyond your control, God is going to call your life back unto himself. This is true of every man. And you do not know when nor how, so live each day to the enjoyment of that day. Live each day to the fullest. It seems like a contradictory statement with all that Solomon's pointing out, but it's the truth. It's the same mindset that we would think in our minds that the person who focuses most on self, looks out most for number one, will be the person most satisfied with what self is producing, with what self is experiencing. And yet it's the opposite of those things, and Solomon's pointing that out. And in the same way, saying, if you will but trust in the Lord for the days that he has given you, then you can know peace in all of your days, no matter the circumstances. Live it reverently and obediently before God, for this is the pathway to true joy, even in the midst of pain and mystery, because this world gives us both. It's been appointed that we will have seasons of grieving and seasons of dancing, seasons of crying and seasons of laughter, for all have been appointed by God and we must go through them. None can avoid them no matter how hard we try. So rather than trying to avoid them, pretend like they're not real, numb ourselves to them, Solomon says there's a better way. Hey, there's a way that by faith in God, recognizing who he is and living in that reality, that we can experience even the brokenness by faith in him with joy. Ecclesiastes is meant to be, is intended to be a final answer to the unbeliever who by God's grace has come to the end of themselves that they're striving after the wind and their natural pursuits and all that this world offers them and recognize it leads them not to where they want to be. And they're asking the question, is there nothing more? Is there no answers? Is this all that there is that I wake up, I strive, I go to bed and I wake up the next day and strive some more? And I'll do that all of my days until death overtakes me. And that's all that there is. Is there nothing more? And Ecclesiastes says, that is true. But yes, there is something more. It's a wonderful answer to the unbeliever who by God's grace and the conviction of the Spirit has been brought to the end of themselves saying, what must I do? But it's not only that. It's also a sweet grace to the believer who needs their mind renewed day by day, to break free from the entanglements of this life so that they might run the race they've entered upon with perseverance to the end. Ecclesiastes is a wonderful gift from God and a tool for us who are running that race to keep our focus where it ought to be, to not be distracted, to not give up, quit running, but to keep running in the face of opposition, to keep running in the face of struggle, to cast off everything which hinders us, and to do away with any sin which would entangle us and run with perseverance the race before us. Chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is adding a new layer to our lives in what he's been building upon for the first three chapters. He says, as you live life in this way, as you live life enjoying the enjoyable aspects day by day and trusting in the Lord in all of them, including what we would call the unenjoyable realities of life, as you do this, make sure that your life is shared with others. That's the simplicity of chapter 4. Make sure that you're viewing not just self as the object of these things, but that you are looking to those around you and not yourself alone. Sometimes it's the simplest truths which escape us the easiest. Oftentimes the renewing of our mind comes in the areas that are foundational. That we know to be true, but we forget in the moments and the struggles. I know that there's much worldly wisdom which espouses this very point. Loving our neighbor is a very uh, 
popular idea in the world in which we live today. The idea of accomplishing peace and being at peace and everybody getting along or whatever terminology you want to look at has become very popular in a multitude of ways. And I know there's much worldly wisdom which espouses this very point. However, there's none like this. There's no worldly wisdom like what we have in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It declares a simple truth, yes. But then unlike worldly wisdom, it carefully and insightfully walks us through why it is true and what we're to do about it. And it does so with such brutal honesty that we realize why so much worldly wisdom falls short. Because it only tells us half the truth and it never confronts why this is true. It tells us to love our neighbor, but it doesn't tell us how. It tells us to get along with others, but it doesn't tell us how. It tells us to live for the moment. It tells us to be uh, satisfied, to have enjoyment, to chase these things and accomplish them, to arrive at them, to experience them. But it never tells us how, and it never rightly deals with the failures that we all face. Ecclesiastes is not that way. It does all of those things. So read with me chapter 4, all 16 verses of this wonderful book. Beginning in verse 1. Solomon says this, Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression, which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead, who are already dead, more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. Then I looked again at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent having neither a son nor a brother. Yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, And for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls, when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him as alone, him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. A poor yet wise lad is better than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to receive instruction. For he has come out of prison to become king, even though he was poor, born poor in his kingdom. I have seen all the living under the sun throng to the side of the second lad who replaces him. There is no end to all the people, to all who are before them, and even the ones who will come after will not be happy with them, for this too is vanity and striving after wind. I hope if you've been here for the last three chapters, there's nothing overly shocking in this chapter. Solomon is saying similar things, but he's building upon it and removing any argument that we might bring. Now this morning, this text, it unfolds with two major themes. The first one is that if you live for self, you will destroy joy or enjoyment. Verses 1 to 6. If you live for yourself, you will destroy joy. And in verses 7 through 16, he says, if you live for others, you will know joy. You will experience joy. Now, those are the two overarching themes, but they're not going to be our points this morning because they break down with multiple subheadings. And as I was looking at how to teach this, all 16 verses, the flow of the chapter is verses 1 to 3, Solomon gives us a reality check. In verses 4 to 8, he, he reveals man's insufficient response to the reality that he's seen. He gives us the right or true and proper answers in verses 9 to 12. And he gives us an ultimate example for a reminder in verses 13 to 16. It breaks down pretty clearly in those areas. So let's begin with the wise preacher's reality check. Hey, let's understand what he's saying. And he, he answers the question the world seeks to avoid. 
Yes, they recognize things are not as they ought to be. That's why there's this overarching desire to correct things, to fix things, to, to do away with, with whatever is the, the hot topic of the day. We're going to fix racism. We're going to fix injustice. We're going to fix global warming. We're going to fix this world. We have it within our power to do so. We just need to go and do it. But no one's ever willing to answer the question, well, just how broken are we? It just what is the repair going to take? How broken are we actually? And the, the, the answer is what Solomon says. When we stare at our world for very long, what is it that we really see? If, if we remove the blinders, the, the rose-colored glasses of, of all that we hope for or in, <clears throat> just how broken are we? What is it that we see? If you look around, you'll see injustice. Solomon pointed this out last week. He said, in the places where there, there ought to be justice, there's wickedness. When, when we look around, we see unfairness, oppression. We see pain, suffering, and struggle. And so what do we do? Well, what's the world's answer? Let's be distracted. Right? It's like the magician. Whenever he tells you, hey, look over here. You, you need to know something else is happening somewhere else. Don't, don't buy into this idea. Well, that's what the world says. Hey, we know that, that that doesn't bring joy and satisfaction. It doesn't bring happiness. So, so let's be distracted. How do we distract ourselves? Well, think about this. One of the, the, the biggest distractions in our cultural modern world is, is the television. Right? What does it promote? What does it produce? What does it portray? Well, we have movies and they portray amazing acts of courage, singular events oftentimes in someone's life that, that, that we can look to and say, wow, they really did something. Singular, wonderful outcomes. He gets the girl. She gets the man. The detective gets his guy. They win the battle. They make it. They succeed, whatever that looks like. Interestingly, that's not sufficient anymore. In our generation, we have to go outside of reality for the distraction that we need. It's no longer sufficient to glimpse achievement. Nowadays, the best-selling movies are about fantasy. Right? They don't even have reality as their basis. And it's a little bit amazing how many young people that I've spoken to who have some idea that, that Superman's real, we just can't find him. He's like Bigfoot. He's real. He's out there somewhere that maybe someday they themselves can be Iron Man or, or whatever the other thing is that they're watching. And it's this idea that, that I need to be distracted from reality to a sufficient capacity to where it doesn't overwhelm me. I don't, I don't want to think on these things. I don't want to look at it. Now outside of Hollywood, we individually strive to accomplish some measure of it ourselves. Right? Think about this. Social media. There's not a greater fantasy land distraction that exists in this modern era than social media. Let me ask you this. If, if, you, if you plan that vacation with the notion that it's going to fix what's broken, what happens to that vacation? It will fall short. You'll, if you put the weight upon your, your planned enjoyment to be sufficient to fix all that's broken, it can't carry that weight. It, it, will, it will buckle under it. So what happens in those things? You see, the more we focus in on self, the more broken we become. And it's, it's contrary to the world's wisdom. The world says you just need to be a better person. Look to yourself and correct these things, fix these things, put on a different persona. Fake it till you make it. All kinds of different worldly advice and wisdom. And, and Solomon's having none of it. His point in verses 1 to 3 is, let's look at this in reality. Let's see it as it is. If we can see how broken it is, then we can understand, is there any fix available? And as he's been explaining to us, no, not in our strength can we fix this. And we understand that. That's why the gospel is such good news. Because it came accomplishing what we can't do. It gives us an eternal hope beyond our circumstance, beyond the things that are broken. And what the preacher's saying is when he stares at humanity in verses 1 to 3, and the reality of the lives in which we live for too long, it becomes unbearable. He, he can't even look at it without it overwhelming him. Listen, listen to what he says. I looked again. At all the acts of oppression. Now remind yourself for a moment. Solomon is king. 
He's king. He, he has power and authority. And he's done amazing things. But when he looks around at the world in which he's done these amazing things with power and authority, what does he still see? Acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed. And that they, the oppressed, had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressor was power. That's why they were the oppressor. But they, being the oppressor, had no one to comfort them. Remember, it's all vanity. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. And I think we at times are tempted to do that. We're tempted to think, man, I just don't know if anything's ever going to change. If it's going to get better, what's the point? He goes on and says, but better off than both of them is the one who's never even existed. Who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. It's hard for us to admit that we're this broken. We don't generally, I don't know that apart from the, the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in Solomon's life, through the, the, the wisdom that was given him by God's grace, that he would have come to these conclusions. Now, I don't think that we would come to these things. We always want to have that continual, even we who are the greatest pessimists, the truth is we want to have some measure of hope, if nothing else, than in self. And we talked about this last week that we, we can't hope in circumstances, in others, or in self, but we can only hope in God alone. And when we read Solomon's words, they almost seem to be too much, too blunt, too pessimistic, too, too much. When I look around at how we treat one another and subsequently then what we can expect from our lives, it is broken to the degree, Solomon says, my conclusion is that the dead are better off than the living. Nay, not even that comes to the degree. The never born are better off than the living and the dead. And my question is, is it really that bad? Do you think it's really that bad? Do you think Solomon has overstepped? Or maybe it was that bad in his time. But interestingly enough, historically, that's not the case. Historically, during the reign of Solomon, things were better than they've ever been. He's not writing this as one who is besieged by war. Israel was at peace under his leadership. He's not one who was besieged by famine and poverty with the dead in the streets and no answers, they were prosperous to the degree that silver became like rocks in the street. It was so common. Their wealth and accomplishment and prosperity and health and peace were at levels they'd never before been experienced when Solomon wrote this. And so my question for us this morning, is it really that bad? Is Solomon just overstepping in his statements? Well, Solomon says, yes. He says, yes, it's that bad. I've observed these things. And I would remind us that he's speaking from a platform wherein his view is infinitely more complete than ours can ever be. He viewed it from a position of authority. He viewed it from a position as king over Israel, as one who knows God and was chosen by God for these roles that we pers <clears throat> personally do not have. It's interesting in that, if you'll notice something about Scripture, look back at verse 1. This is where the world, again, falls short. We tend to look at things, and it's easy for us that, that we would be concerned with the oppressed. Right? That that would be our concern. We would look to those who are being oppressed and think of the wicked oppressors. We, we hope something bad befalls them. We have no mercy, no grace for the oppressor, the one with the authority doing this wicked act. We only have that for the oppressed, but praise God, he's not like us. He looks upon our sin and loves us in spite of those things. And here scripture points it out. It's, it's not just concerned with the oppressed, but with the oppressors also, because both are suffering under the hebel realities of life. Both of them are experiencing vanity. Hey, we look at things and we want to judge everything that we see by the f very finite realities of our, our ability to see those things. We want to look at the world around us and think, oh my goodness, this is horrible because it seems horrible to the way I feel about it. But then what we end up doing is judging God by our standards. 
And so when Solomon looks around, he says, this is what's horrible. All is vanity. Even if you have authority and power and use it to, to exert yourself over others, you're not satisfied and there's no one to comfort you. And even if you're the one who's under the thumb of the oppressor, you're not satisfied and there's no one to comfort you. He's pointing out very simply that, that those who live for themselves always end up dissatisfied. No matter which side of that coin you're on. It's amazing when we consider the depth of Solomon's wisdom and views. One of the greatest struggles, I think, with our generation is, is we live in a screen-generated, fast-paced, everyone's got a schedule society, and there's very little meditation upon God's Word. Right? We very rarely, if ever, take the time to actually think upon, to exercise the brain which God has given us to the examination of things and then asking the question internally of how do I take this truth and then begin recognizing application to self. Everything's fast paced, one thing to the next, to the next, to the degree that we rarely ever pause and think deeply about anything. Thankfully, God's word does that for us if we'll dig into it. And that's what, what we see in this. It, Solomon's looking at both the oppressor and the oppressed. And saying both are living in the hevel, the futile, the vanity of this world. There's no winning. It, it, whichever side you're on. Now I think most of us would have probably read this quickly and said, yeah, those who oppress are wicked and evil. It's bad. Look at the tears of the oppressed. We need to fix that dictatorship and all these things are wrong. And so, that's not what Solomon's saying. He's saying that all is vanity. The one oppressed by the powerful is miserable and without peace nor satisfaction. And that makes sense to us. But he also says the one with power doing the oppression, oppressing is also without peace nor satisfaction. Now let me ask you something. Are we not tempted in our own selfish views if we view it through the lens of the one with power is somehow self-satisfied that there's not a temptation for us or for others who have that same view to think that's who I want to be. I, I want to be the one with the power and authority. Of course I'll exercise it better. But we won't. And so Solomon's simply pointing out in all of this world Whichever side of the coin you're striving, if you're the one being oppressed and you think somehow that by becoming the one with the authority will make you have peace and satisfaction, it won't. We're naturally bent towards looking out for self. But what's the answer to a life abundant? It's to look to God and then towards others. Consider the words of Christ in Matthew 22, a very familiar text. One that all of you will recognize in verses 37 down to 40. A man came and asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And he said this. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. But the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend or hang the entire law and prophets. What an amazing statement that he would take the entire law and prophets and hang them on this and say, if you don't have these two right, none of it makes sense. It's just a jumbled disarray of things because you don't have them properly in order. You need these two before you and then you can see how they hang. And so when you look at this, the, hey, we recognize those truths. This, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The question becomes, as we looked at earlier, how much do you love yourself? Well, how honest are you willing to be? Right? Scripture teaches us, and we'll look at this more fully, but it teaches us that no man ever hated his own flesh. But he cherishes it. He nourishes it. And as I said before, if there was an ability, someone invented a machine that could record every thought of a person, every human being's heart and mind, the singular predominant focus that would rise quickly to the majority in all things and in all days would be self. How am I doing? How am I being viewed? How am I accomplishing? How is, this being, how is this being registered? How is this going to do what I want it to do? How am I pursuing what I want to accomplish? And so on and so forth and never ending continually. And so my question is, okay, if it's true, then why is it that we think that Solomon's so blunt and bleak in his statements? 
Right? If it's true, why do, why do we struggle? Why are we offended by the way that Solomon addresses it? Because we don't want it to be true. And because we want to believe something else. Which is why I believe Solomon, through the insp inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is so blunt and bleak in his statements. I don't think he gives us room for that. Because no one will do th the things he calls us to who doesn't believe that the natural realities of self can't fix it. In other words, if we're naturally in our own natural self, focused on self, desirous of self, promoting of self, protective of self, something's got to break that loose. And it won't come from within. It won't come from within. Now, I want to give us something to kind of help us see life as Solomon is describing it. Something for us to think through. I'm not calling you to do this. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you not to do this. But I want you to pause for a moment and think about how it would turn out if you did do this. Watch the news cycle for one week. Now, some of you may already do that. So I'm not done. Look intently at and immerse yourself in what is going on around the world. Immerse yourself in it. What do I mean by immerse yourself? Do not look to, to God nor his word for hope. Do not distract yourself with comedic relief nor fantasy through movies or social media. Simply watch the news and immerse yourself in all that is going on around for one week. Probably won't take that long. But you start to watch how you begin to respond. You will be an angry person. It will naturally happen. You will be an angry person who looks around and says, It's all broken. All of it's messed up. You look intently, immerse yourself and see those things. Shut yourself off from others and do nothing but gaze upon and drink in what is going on and see what your outlook will be. You see, it's not wrong what Solomon's saying. And deep inside, we know that. Solomon is king, and more than that, is an aged king. He's someone who's been there, done that, and got all the t-shirts, so to speak. He's left with no illusions about the world in which we inhabit. He's gazed at it through the lens of wisdom. He says, I set my mind in wisdom to view these things. I, I set my body to experience these things. We've already walked through this in the first three chapters. Think about this. Look, you don't even have to watch how broken the world is. Watch the news cycle across three different channels on the political situation and leadership in, in our nation. And don't stop there because consider this. Whichever side you think is correct, 50%, roughly, of the rest of this nation disagrees with you. Disagrees with you to the fact that they probably hate you. Just as many on this side would say the same about them apart from the Lord. Think about that for a moment. When you think about it, humanity is pursuing after it. Leadership is imbibing it. Someone sent me a link a couple weeks ago, and, and the link was, I think it said, the song that broke the internet. Now, I'm not sending you to listen to this song, but it, it's interesting to me. It was some regular guy in a t-shirt with a dog around him out in the middle of the woods, singing about the injustice and oppression that he's experiencing. And this song resonated with so many human beings that it's now known all around the world. In a short amount of time, it went everywhere. And people responded to it because it resonated with their own experience and what they were viewing. And so it's not an unusual thing. And it makes perfect sense that Solomon would give us a reality check. And that he would say in, in, in verses 1 to 3 that this is where we're actually at. Do we not realize that? We want to distract ourselves from it. We want to pretend it's not so. But in order for us to ever see a way forward in fixing anything, we need to have a clear view of just how broken it is. And so he shows us that man's common response is woefully inadequate in verses 4 to 6. This is what's true. This is what man does, and it's not enough. In verse 4, Solomon shows us that man's response to just work harder does not answer the real problem. Listen to verse 4. 
I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. Why is there oppression? Why is there, why is this struggle happening? Well, because this is what is true. Every labor and every skill. Now he uses language there that's pretty strong with that term every. Without exception. Everything that's done is a result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after win. This is an incredibly insightful and exceedingly difficult statement for us to take in. Why? Because we're prideful. Because we want to believe, we want to, we want to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We want to boast in self and say, no, may it never be that I would act that way. If we're like Peter who says, I'll never deny you. How could you even think that? Of course that won't happen. Lord, I'm so offended that you would even say such a thing to me. We're all that guy. Every one of us in our own strength and to our own devices. And Solomon simply assessing and recognizing it and selling, telling us when you'll see this rightly, when you'll through the lens of reality assess the situation, now we can get somewhere. Solomon says that everything a man accomplishes stems from rivalry or envy between mankind. When, when we think that pursuing gain is the answer to our brokenness, we just compound that problem. Right? It just accelerates the competition. It just accelerates the rivalry and the envy and it never ends. It's like getting thrown in a washing machine. And it just rolls us and we just get rolled continually. Simply put, Doing those things, what does it grow? Selfishness. And as mankind pursues selfishness, which is natural, it also then grows oppression. And misery for all, the oppressor and the oppressed. We don't like to be this honest about ourselves, do we? That's why we don't like Ecclesiastes. Because it forces us to say, woe is me. I'm a person of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. I am undone. There's nothing good in me. It's amazing how many people who have claimed faith in Christ still think there's something worthy of themselves to have received Christ's grace. Grace by its definition denies that. The only good thing about me is Jesus. And I know enough about me to believe that to be true, even though I try and distract myself and deny it and live as though it's not. We don't like to be this honest. The world wants to tell us, you have to take care of others. But it refuses to deal with the condition of the individual, which has infected the entirety of humanity. And so if we don't deal with the condition, how can we ever fix the problem? Until we are honest, this honest about ourselves, we will be constrained to continue in the brokenness which corrupts and cannot satisfy. What the world calls love is simply an understanding of caring for an individual in order to receive something we want from them. That's the definition of love. And that's why people fall in and out of it. Because it's not true love. It's not what God designed and, and brought to us. It's, it's a man-made construct built in what? Selfishness. I'll love you as long as you're pleasing to me. And I'll be pleasing to you as long as, as, as you'll love me. And, and it just be, creates a cycle that never ends. Now, this, by the way, is sadly not constrained to this world. It also happens within Christianity. It's why a majority of what you see in the epistles from, from Paul and the others is calling to the protection of unity, to the forgiving of one another, to all of these things. Turn with me real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It'll be on the screen. It's the, the last verse in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul is walking through body life. And if you're familiar with the Corinthian church, they were, they were wildly and selfishly promoting themselves with the gifts that the Spirit had given to them in that first generation. And Paul's correcting that. He begins in chapter 12 saying, I don't want you to be ignorant about these gifts. You're abusing, you're mishandling them. We see that further in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, where he deals with how they were taking the Lord's table and, and those things. But, but listen to what he says at the end of 1 Corinthians 12. I, I, at the second half of verse 31, he says, I, And I'll show you a still more excellent way. 
And he goes into this description, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Man, if I share insight that's so deep, but I do so from a standard that's not loving, it sounds like someone banging on a pot and pan in my ear. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. And then to be clear, he says, here's what I mean by love. Love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. But rejoices with the truth. Why did Paul have to put that in there? Because Christians struggle to love one another as we ought. And we have to be reminded. We need to have definitions. Lest our flesh and the natural realities of self creep in. And before very long, we look just like the world. We need this continual reminder. The Bible is continually reminding us about this, isn't it? When you read the New Testament, how many times are we told that we must love one another? Biblically defined. Not worldly defined. Not love one another. Hey, as long as you do what I want you to do, I'll love you. Hey, as long as I'm viewing you through the lens of my expectation of you and you're willing to step up to that plate, I'll take care of you. That's not the picture. Remember what we just read. It's continually reminding us to love one another. And it doesn't stop there. It's continually reminding us to forgive one another. It's continually reminding us to preserve the unity that God has given us in his spirit. It's continually reminding us that we are to be those who look out for others more than self. I love in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, Listen, if, if you speak well to those whom you like, what do you do that's more than the Gentiles or unbelievers do? You see, the reality of Christianity is it calls us to more than anything that the world offers or does. It calls us to greater than. We have to look out for others more than self. It tells us that giving is better than receiving. Now, this is not natural to our condition. This only comes with redemption and regeneration applied to our fallen condition. Left in our fallen condition, we'll do what's natural. We'll love self, promote self, protect self, look out for number one. And when you get this many people, when you get two people who are both looking out for number one, it doesn't work. When you get eight billion people who are all looking out for number one, it really doesn't work. So the realities that we face. Left to our own devices, self will rule the day. That's what Solomon's pointing out. Look around. It, it happens. And we live in a world of individuals wherein self rules the day. What we're left with is corruption and oppression, vanity, and striving after wind. That's what we're left with. Brothers and sisters, we're called to greater things. All right? We were created for greater things. That's why Paul describes what we just read as a more excellent way. I know what's natural. I have natural all over me. It's all within me. But by the grace of Christ and through the power of the Spirit and according to God's Word, I know that there's a greater way, a more excellent way. I don't have to submit myself to believing that love is a simple transaction between two people of you give me what I want and I'll strive to get you, give you what you want and we'll call that love until it's not. What a lie. And what a brokenness. And what a less than. Right? Isn't it amazing that we, we hold up the worldly standards as though they're the greatest things ever. And all they keep doing is putting mud in our face. Keep bringing brokenness to generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. And we could keep going. It doesn't end. It keeps doing those things. We are called to greater things. We are salt and we are light. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We are those who have been given the spiritual joy that is unshakable by any other thing. We are those who are confident that he who begun this work in us, he will see it through to completion. We are those who know that we know that we know that Christ shall return for those who are his and where he is we shall be with him. It changes everything. 
Nothing is left the same. And that's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5. For we who are in Christ, we are a new creation. Behold, all things, all things have become new. When man lives for self, there are two extremes which will naturally win the day. You say, well, what's the danger, right? If it's so natural, well, what, what exactly is the danger? Well, the first one's in verse 5. He will become a lazy fool. Right? If man lives for self, this is where it will lead him. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Solomon poetically describes this one so well in this verse. If you think about that term for just a minute, it makes sense. This, this is someone who looks around and says, man, it's not working. I'll just throw in the towel. I'll just give in to all the desires and all the things and, until it overwhelms me. The foolish person does not embrace life does not see the giving of themselves to others in any way worthwhile. They've given themselves over to the selfish, natural realities that are there. As one commentator notes, this, the sluggard is one who gives themselves to themselves so that in the end, all that he has left is himself and the truth is that won't last for long. In other words, there's no food in the cupboard and he has to eat himself to survive. He goes on and says this. Now, you've likely never seen a lazy person actually eat themselves. But you've probably seen a lazy person erode their self-control and capacity for care. And in the end, erase even his self-respect. They ruin themselves. Think about that. Is that not true? That's the extreme that we'll go to if left to our own devices. If we're not striving after what Solomon's going to point us to. If self becomes the ruling factor of our lives, the first extreme that will show itself is a lazy fool who folds his hands, throws in the towel, and consumes himself. Hey, look with me real quick. I, I want to show you something. It won't be on the screen because I didn't give it to the guys. But we have a few minutes. So we're ahead of schedule for the moment. Turn with me to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, I want to show you an example of this. It's a well-known section that oftentimes gets, gets overlooked. And it kind of points that, well, how, how, do, how is this accomplished? How do we do this? It's not only found in Ecclesiastes. It's all over the pages of Scripture. In Matthew 7, look first at verse 7 and following. We have this passage that most people wrongly assume is about prayer. It says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And him who knocks it will be open. Now, if you've been a believer for, for more than an hour, you know there's some struggles if that really is about prayer. Because there are those, every one of us that have those prayers where we've asked, we've sought, and we've knocked. And it hasn't been opened. We haven't found it. And it hasn't been given. So if this is about prayer, something's wrong. But that's the assumption. He goes on and says this. Or, meaning, let me give you another example. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a, state, a snake, will he? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Well, your Father who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him. So what is the point of that? Well, you actually have to go to the next verse to see it. In the verse 12, very familiar. You might know it as the golden rule. Right? I can remember in, in school, in elementary school, in a public school, the golden rule. We recited it every morning. A little reminder for us of how we were supposed to act that day. There's probably not many unbelievers in this world that don't know the golden rule or haven't heard it. Can I ask you something? If you know the golden rule, how well do you do with it? How well do you treat others according to how you want them to treat you? Or is what's natural to you to treat them according to how they do treat you? Or maybe even better yet, according to how you expect them to treat you? There are people who laughingly say things like, I don't get even, I get ahead. And I said, no, you sin. Because you're violating what Christ has commanded. Right? Well, we joke about these things, but it's not a joke. And this is what he says, and everything therefore. Now we know that word therefore does what? 
It says we need to look back and see what it's there for. And everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, what did Jesus just say? He said, if you look to people for the reason to treat them in this way, you'll always treat them in a way that's not in accordance with who I've called you to be. But if you'll look to your heavenly Father who will take care of you, then by faith in him you can treat others as you ought to treat them. Not according to how they've treated you, not according to how you expect them to treat you, but according to how you know he will care for you. And by faith in him you can treat them in accordance with the golden rule. The golden rule is terribly impossible for us to accomplish in our own strength. But by faith in him, it's not a meaningless command. In the same way, that's what, that's what we're looking at. Solomon's saying, listen, the common thing, if you try and do these things according to what makes sense to you. Remember what we started with. It seems to make sense rationally that, that the more someone protects self, promotes self, focuses on self, the more satisfied that person will be with self. And Solomon says, wrong, as does all of Scripture. No, it'll be the opposite. You will become a lazy fool. You'll throw in the towel. What's the point? All I know about self is that this is what I want, and so it just needs to be given to me. And Solomon says, no, you'll eat yourself. You'll wear yourself out. The second one is along the same line, and it's no better. You'll either become a lazy fool or you'll be filled with frantic busyness. Verse 6, one hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. This person is always working for tomorrow to the result they never enjoy today. It's a miserable person. They're always worried about what's coming. And Jesus commands us clearly, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own. Live in today. Why? Because your heavenly father knows what you need for tomorrow. He's already taken care of it. And the day he doesn't, you go to heaven. Right? We look at things we're like, oh, but what about? Okay, yeah. There may come a day when you might starve to death and you'll go to heaven. When he chooses to not provide for you in whatever form that comes, you will go to heaven. It's not like you lose something in that transaction. So why worry? Can you add one hour to your life by worrying? So why would you waste today worrying about tomorrow when it changes nothing, does nothing, only harms? But we go to that extreme. When we only look to self. Frantic busyness. This person's always working for tomorrow. One commentator notes this is like someone shooting themselves in the foot. So that they can hop faster on the other. This person is also a consumer of self and others. But like the lazy fool, they find no satisfaction. An example that easily comes to mind is when I see parents longing for the next season of life with their children. If I can just get them out of diapers... And less dependent for everything, life will get better. And then they're out of diapers, but now they talk. <laughs> and they throw fits. And they do all the things that children do in the seasons of life. And what happens to that parent who's, who's only longing to get them to the next season? Well, they miss out on all the joys of that season. They'll only be 363 days old once. One day in your children's life will they be that old. And then it's gone. And if you're looking for that 370th day, you'll miss all the ones before it. Then they just want them to grow up, learn the lessons, become more functional so that they can be friends and do fun and interesting things with them. And they miss out on the joys of that season of their children's lives. And then they hit the teenage years and you're in survival mode. And before you know it, they're out of the house and you're wondering what happened. Solomon's saying, live the life you have now. Instead of longing for the one you think you want, but actually don't control. What, a, what an exercise in futility. To live your life for what you don't have and don't have the control to, to, to cause, to bring. To the neglect, to the waste of what you do have. The sluggard consumes others by believing they exist to take care of them. But the driven person consumes others by believing that they are but stepping stones to the next season that they want. Ultimately, both are miserable. Solomon says there's a better way. As Paul says, a more excellent way, a balanced way, wherein we live according to what we have rather than what we want. And it's interesting because he tells us in verses 9 to 12 how to overcome what is natural 
And avoid the extremes that that brings. We just looked at in verses 5 and 6. But he gives us one more example in 7 to 8 to help us see how real this is. Verse 7, I looked again at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, And for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. This is what a life lived for me looks like and results in. A life that was created for community, but has been driven to aloneness. Now, understand this. Sometimes people look at this and say, well, this is talking about like, like being wealthy and other things. No, it doesn't always display itself in financial success by the world standard. It's often a personal standard. And that sometimes becomes a justification. I don't want to be rich. I just want to be comfortable. I don't want to have this, but I don't want to worry. I want to, at the end of the day, he's not pointing to what the goal is. He's pointing to where the goal has led the person. This person has established their desired goals and then have labored with all their might to the achieving of them. With the result being success and loneliness. Now sadly, this often happens to a person who in fact does have a family. This is the crazy part. What Solomon is describing is someone who labors that way because they don't have one. But it happens equally to those who do. Someone who does have a family but has neglected the blessings and responsibility from God they, that their family is for their desired pursuits of the world, for the achievement of their own goals. And guess what it does? It constrains the next generation to further brokenness. One pastor made note of this, and as I read it, I can wholeheartedly agree and affirm this. I'm going I'm to give you a paraphrase of what he said. But it's absolutely clear. He said this. He's never had a girl come into his office in tears and tell him that she hates her dad because he used to drop her off to school in a beat up old truck. And it was so embarrassing she's never been able to forgive him. He's never had a girl hate her dad because he didn't buy her a pony or send her on the school trip. But he's had plenty of young women whose father had plenty and provided plenty of material things. Yet these women never knew the love of their father because his love of the world was all that he pursued. And so had been given a thoroughly warped perception of their own value. A whole line of those with that struggle come through the door. It's possible, one author says, to know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Solomon says this is vanity and a grievous task. And we can certainly see the outcomes. So having looked at what is real. And considered what is common. Someone says here's the answer that keeps these realities at bay. What do we do? If the world doesn't work. If looking at self which makes sense. Doesn't promote self to the point of satisfaction in self. Then what must we do? Solomon says here are the true answers. Verses 9 down to 12. Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. For if either one of them falls, the other one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A quarter of three strands is not quickly torn apart or not easily broken. <clears throat> we are taught in scripture that no man ever hated his own flesh. But they cherish and nourish it. Ephesians chapter 5 speaks of the, the relationship between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. And what it says is, this is true about you. Now apply it to your spouse. The way in which you love your own flesh, love them. While this is the natural condition of each of us to be selfish, we recognize when we look around where it leads us. And Solomon simply laying the foundation for what we read earlier in Matthew 22. The value in this life is not in what you have, but who you have it with. Not in what you buy, but in what you give. We're told in scripture that the love of money is the root of all evil. And the Bible has a simple solution to this. Spend your money on others. Spend your time on others. Spend your effort on others. Being wealthy is not sinful. Loving your wealth is. How do you keep this from happening? Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. That's how you keep it from happening. If you have... You ought to share, you ought to give, you ought to participate. And if you think, no, I'm going to protect, I'm going to guard, I'm going to hang on to, I'm going to be satisfied with, 
you will become miserable. <clears throat> That's good wisdom, right? Just makes sense. Two are better than one. Three is better than two. Live your life loving and caring for others. And what this does is it breaks the natural love of self, which ultimately destroys. And instead, guess what it replaces it with? A true care of self and genuine satisfaction. If you wake up every day thinking of how you can serve someone else, you'll go to bed every night satisfied. If you wake up every day thinking of how you can serve yourself, you'll have a hard time sleeping that night. If you live for self, then self is what you'll be left with. And trust me when I tell you, as much as you think you're great, you'll find out you're not. Two will give your work meaning and even a better return. Two will give care to your life as they care for you and you care for them. Two will keep you warm at night. And two will mean someone always has your back. It, it really is the simple things, isn't it? We tend to overlook this because we make it so complicated. Well, yes, but what about? Every time I teach a sermon like this, I'll get 50 questions of specific details. Well, what about when someone takes advantage? Well, what about when someone does this? And what about when this happens? And what about that? And what about this? Solomon says, get your head out of the sand and look at what's before you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Forgive one another and all things as Christ has forgiven you. How has Christ forgiven you? More than you'll ever forgive anyone else. It really is that simple. Are you tempted to say no? It has to be more complicated. There has to be more to life. Listen to Solomon's wisdom in the final reminder before you have to learn this lesson the hard way. I believe this was especially poignant to him. It's an interesting reminder. It's in 13 down to 16. A poor yet wise lad is better than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to receive instruction for he has come out of prison to become king even though he was born poor in his kingdom. I have seen all the living under the sun throng to the side of the second lad who replaces him. There is no end to all the people. To all who were before them and even the ones who will come after, come later will not be happy with them for this too is vanity and striving after win. Now I chuckle because this was apparently a very difficult section. Three out of four commentators that I've been using didn't touch it. They literally did chapter 4 and never addressed 13 to 16. Didn't say one word about it. Just ended with verse 12. And the one who did spent a majority of time explaining why it's difficult and confusing. I think Solomon simply looking at an example he's observed under the sun that's especially poignant to him, whether it's within his own kingdom or something he's seen happen in other kingdoms as an aged man. He's seen this before. And I think it's pretty evident given who the author, the human author is. What he's saying is very simply this. Even if you achieve the greatest successes in life, it's still Hebel. It's still Hebel. Listen, everybody at some point wants to be king. You want it. I want it. You can admit it. You might not want it in this moment, but you want it. You let yourself be at odds with someone and you wish I had authority and power. It's dangerous for me to drive around. That's so often that I'm like, I wish I was a cop today. Right? Not overall in all things, but when I'm driving around and I see the hebel of others driving, I'm like, oh, if I had authority in this moment, I would really do something with it. Right? We all want to be king at some point. But even, but to be a king, to be an old king is vanity. And to be an up and coming king, it's also vanity. For both end the same. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. But to walk a balanced path for and with others, that's the key to experiencing fulfilled days. It's a simple truth. It's a truth the world constantly espouses to us, but it never takes us all the way to the bottom so that we can see rightly what's broken, and it never tells us the way forward to the fullest extent. Like Solomon has done here in chapter 4. And make no mistake, these things are only possible through the new life which we have in Christ, who himself lived in the hevel of this life under the same flesh that we have while setting the example of what it means to love others and live with and for them. He gave himself in every way and called us to follow his example. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are thankful 
for your grace, for we desperately need it. We're thankful for your example, for it keeps us striving all of our days. Lord, we in our strength would never even turn our eyes to your example. We would think that you were weak. We would think that you failed. We would think a multitude of things. But we would never in our natural self look to you as our example. But Lord, by faith in you and by the strength of your spirit, by the regenerating work that, that you have accomplished by redeeming us, we look to you as our example. And I, I just want to pause this morning and thank you for the example you set, for the righteousness that you put forth, for the commands that you gave, having lived them. Lord, that even those who are screaming, crucify, and mocking you, that you asked for their forgiveness and their ignorance. Lord, would we follow your example? Would we live this life not towards self, recognizing that that is what naturally will come to us? If we follow our feelings, our feelings will always lead us towards self. But if we'll follow your word, it will lead us towards others. And when we do that, then self experiences what it's always been wanted. Satisfaction, peace. Lord, we thank you that these are gifts from you. And I pray for all who are here that there are those who need to be regenerated, having never trusted in you for their satisfaction, for their hope, having never seen the condition as broken as it truly is. And Lord, for those who are here who have seen these things but need to be renewed in their mind and their thinking, need to be realigned in their paths, that your word would accomplish this in our lives this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.